Good morning, everyone. Monseigneur, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the press conference on the Monaco explorations. I am Enric Sala, explorer in residence at National Geographic Society. And this morning, we're going to hear about a project that combines the classic and the new, the old tradition of exploration with space age technologies, and also storytelling to learn about the ocean, but also to inspire people to act. There are moments in time that are key for the future of humanity, and we believe that the Sustainable Development Goals, together with the Paris Climate Agreement, is one of these moments. It's the first time that the global community has got together to make a plan for the future of the planet and for the ocean. And this is the first time that the UN has organized a fully dedicated ocean conference. The deadline for delivering the Sustainable Development Goals is 2030, but there are many mail milestones along the way that will help us determine whether we can craft a better path for the future. So this morning we'll hear from His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, Professor Margaret Leinen of Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California, and Professor Francois Gail of France's National Research Council. Before we start, we'd like to show a short video. <laughs> there you go. Three years traveling on the seas and oceans of the globe, starting in August 2017. Monaco Explorations embark on an original project and a multidisciplinary scientific program. Dozens of researchers will take turns working on issues such as protecting biodiversity, participating in the preservation of endangered species, studying the impact of interaction between mankind and oceans, discovering deep sea megafauna, characterizing and extending protected marine areas, mapping underwater mounts, those lesser known biodiversity hotspots that are nonetheless in danger. Despite the fact that oceans cover more than 70% of the surface of the planet, we know less about them than the moon. Yet, they represent a core issue for biodiversity, for the climate, and therefore for humanity. Hence, Monaco's decision to get involved in a new way, through ship owner Francois Fia, who is making available a multi-purpose research platform, the clean ship Yersin, the very first of its kind to be able to sail for 10 days without producing any waste. The boat is equipped according to recommendations provided by the Scientific Orientation Committee, which drafted a demanding program for the next three years. It makes use of the latest innovative technologies that combine environmental DNA, samples, and mobile machines designed for great depths, with electronic sensors to collect, amongst other things, real-time data on the acidification of the oceans. More than a century later, Monaco is continuing the great maritime explorations undertaken by Prince Albert I, who is considered the father of modern oceanography, with teams being deployed on some of the same sites. These projects, led by Prince Albert II, are also meant to provide some explanation and improve understanding to be a time for communication between man and the ocean that will suggest new opportunities for sustainable management. On the 27th of July, the Yersin will leave Monaco, its home port, to head for Macronesia, off the African shore, near Madeira and Cape Verde, to begin its long scientific adventure in August. Monseigneur, could you please explain what brought you to launch the Monaco exploration? Well, thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your, your excellencies, uh, dear friends. Thank you for being here this morning and for attending this presentation on a project which is particularly close to my heart, this, uh, this project, the Explorations of Monaco. You've already just seen the, uh, the core of the program and the course that uh, will be charted over the next three years and the approach guiding these explorations. It will not make any additional comments on this, but I'd like to uh, address the, uh, the uh, few 
moments of the founding principles which motivated me and, and the team around me to uh, undertake this project and to come today to present it to you. The preservation of our environment uh, has become, as you know, a, a priority of our time. What was only a few years ago a, for most people, uh, not for us at this table or uh, in, uh, I think most of us in this room, uh, not a secondary con consideration, but for some people, of course it was, and nowadays appears to be a universal imperative shared by most governments of the world. That is shown in the Sustainable Development Goals, which bring us all to New York here this week, and especially this uh, special conference on SDG 14, which of course, as you all know, deals with the oceans and the need to better understand them and better protect them. My government, I've personally contributed to the, to the developing of this extremely important and initiative and, and, and innovative, I'm sorry, SDG. It is at the heart of a number of my priorities and a part of a long tradition of the Principality of Monaco. Indeed, for almost a century, the Principality has been committed to the oceans, to understanding them, and to try to protect them. Today, that commitment is renewed via the explorations of Monaco. Our commitment can be summarized in three points. First, the, the necessity of changing the way we look at the ocean. For, for centuries, if not millennia, humanity has seen the ocean as an, as an um, omnipotent expanse from which uh, the fragile little man had to protect himself. Nowadays, it's the opposite. Uh, man is virtually omnipotent, and the ocean is fragile. The ocean has to be protected. It is a human power that needs to be better controlled. The situation implies a new model of development, which, we, which must be sustainable and re respectful of our environment, one which I'm endeavoring, along with many others, to promote through the commitment and responsible policies of my government and my involvement in international fora and negotiations, but particularly here at the UN. The second point is the necessity to know the oceans better. For if today the oceans are victim of our civilization's many excesses, if they are undergoing, uh, uh, and we are undergoing, of course, global warming, acidification, pollution of various types, overfishing, and the, the, the destruction of different ecosystems, more than anything else, they are suffering from our ignorance and our indifference. That is why the Principality of Monaco, whose entire horizon faces the sea, has always chosen to protect the oceans with the collaboration of scientists. This was particularly so with my great-great-grandfather, Prince Albert I, who was known as the Scholar Prince. He created the Oceanographic Institute of Paris and the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco. Above all, he was one of the founders of, mo of modern oceanography, an impassioned explorer, a rigorous scientist, a responsible head of state. He established abiding connections between the principality and the scientific community and to the service of the seas. More than ever, I wish to promote these links, to, to enrich them, to strengthen them, to achieve my goal, our goal, aiming to reconcile mankind and the sea. Finally, the third point which guides our efforts is to encourage maximum participation political decision makers, economic stakeholders, NGOs, civil society, and public opinion. In this respect, the first campaign of explorations will be an, an opportunity to, to take a look at Macronesia, not Micronesia, Macronesia off the coast of Africa. The, the Yersin, our scientific exploration vessel, will make its Atlantic Ocean debut next August off the coast of Africa around the Portuguese archipelago of Madeira for its maiden research mission. We'll be looking at the protection of different species, marine biology, in environmental DNA, the, the extension of an MPA, of a marine protected area, in liaison with the Portuguese authorities. Um, I think we will be able to meet with the Portuguese president, His, His Excellency Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, beginning of September to discuss these particular issues. These three requirements, changing our relationship to the sea, deepening our understanding, and maximizing our involvement are at the heart of the project which brings us here 
this morning. The explorations of Monaco are indeed at the hub of these three issues. By the, in, by the innovative nature of, of the vessel, the, the Ursin, whose unique characteristics uh, you have seen, but will be presented to you more in detail later, I think. By the program of the thoroughness of the missions, which Mrs. Margaret Leinen and Mrs. Francoise Gail will present to you shortly. And finally, by the attractiveness of the project, which will host renowned head scientists and will generate meetings where it anchors in constant contact with the public via an ambitious com communication program. It is for these reasons that I wanted to be personally involved in this unique project by, by mobilizing my government and bring it, bringing together leading authorities and personalities and the driving forces of the principality, in particular my, my foundation, the, the Oceanographic Museum, and the CSM, the Monaco Science Center. Uh, all answered our, our call and are now moving forward together, moved by this immense ambition of making peace between mankind and the sea. I hope we will get you on board as we uh, face a major challenge, one of the great adventures, I think, of, of, these, of at least this, this part of our century, and one of the most important and one of the most urgent. Thank you very much. Pass it back to Rick. Thank you, Monsignor. You have mentioned scientific research. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Professor Leinen, why is scientific research an, uh, such an important component of the explorations of Monaco? Uh, the scientific research that is planned for these cruises is extremely important because it allows us to look at, the, at all of the relationships between the organisms, the biodiversity, the chemistry, and the physics of the ocean uh, to really be able to understand what is controlling what we see. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Francois and I were at a session where we were talking about exploration and that exploration now is not just about finding things and going to places that haven't been seen before, but also understanding relationships. And one of the key elements of, of uh, this opportunity is the technological capability of the ship. Uh, there are six different laboratories on the ship so that scientists of all kinds with all specialties uh, can go along on the cruise. So people can look at the, uh, the chemistry that leads to acidification. They can look at all of the different kinds of organisms. They can look at the currents and the way they interact. Uh, so it's a very interdisciplinary approach. Uh, I think the second thing that is really important here is all of the places that are going to be visited. This is a, uh, a set of cruises that will, uh, that will go to some of the places that are very difficult for oceanographers to visit routinely, the South Pacific, uh, the, the Central and Southern Indian Ocean, uh, even the transects between the islands that are going to be visited are important because they provide opportunities for us to, uh, to look at, at what's happening in parts of the ocean that we just don't get to. And the third is the size. This is a 250-foot vessel. It's an extremely capable vessel, as capable as many uh, government uh, oceanographic vessels. And it has uh, the unique capability of of uh, being entirely clean, not being able, or not um, uh, shedding any uh, pollutants from the ship itself. So that means that when we study the water, uh, it will be unpolluted by uh, petroleum or, or oil or anything from the ship itself. Uh, and that's, again, an extraordinary uh, opportunity. Uh, even 10 years ago, it was very difficult to find platforms 
that were clean to be able to study trace elements, small amounts of pesticide or herbicide that are in the water. So these three things, the, the path that the ship will take, its capability, its technical capability, and the size to be able to accommodate really large scientific teams are all a key to being able to be successful in understanding not only what's there, but what the relationships are that are so important. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So we have a, a ship with great assets, and the ship is going to be visiting very remote locations that are difficult to get to. So Professor Gail, in your opinion, what are the topics that the Monaco exploration should focus on? Uh, anybody agrees about the urgency of uh, protecting the planet, especially the blue part of it, the ocean and its inhabitant. But to well protect, we need a deep knowledge of this environment which is lacking today. The ocean is the latest continent which has to be discovered. And the Monaco exploration are the opportunity to fill this gap of this unawareness. It is said that we have identified about 10% of the marine biodiversity today, and we have to explore the ocean for knowing what are the species living there, with what type of behavior facing which stressors, climate change, plastic pollutions, but also noise stressors. The originality of this Monaco research program is to mix the visible and the unseen. The visible are these animals larger than one meter, when the non-visible is their molecular footprint, the environmental DNA. And today we are able to reconstruct the history of a site and to determine who is there, but also who was there, when, and with whom. One assumption is that small islands removed from human activities are the last refuge of this medium-sized fauna. This Monaco exploration will allow us to test this assumption on small islands as well on seamounts, which are hard area for fishing. And such research program will help to find means for not only conserve more, but keep better. Thank you very much, Francois. So I'd like to add that one of, a major goal of the Monaco explorations is to contribute to the global goal of 10% of the ocean protected by 2020, which appropriately is also the date for the end of the expedition. But what do we mean by protecting and why 10%? And I don't need to remind the audience about all the bad things that we are doing to the ocean. But I'd like to remind you that today, only 3.5% of the ocean is under some type of protection and less than 2% is in fully protected areas, not take marine reserves that prohibit extraction of resources. And there are many kinds of marine protected areas, from no take areas to areas that allow most types of fishing, but I like to focus on these no take areas, which are, have been shown to be the most effective type of protection in the ocean. Um, we have a new study coming out that shows that Nautic areas have almost seven times more fish than the unprotected areas nearby. They also help to replenish the fisheries around their boundaries, so they act as a savings account that helps the fishermen, and in some places the incomes of fishermen have doubled in only three years thanks to these reserves. Also, when the fish come back, the divers come in helping to develop ecotourism businesses that provide more jobs and bring more revenue than fishing. And also healthy ecosystems have been shown to be more resilient to the effects of, of climate change. And these are the facts from hundreds of scientific and economic studies from around the world. This is why it's so important that you know, we, have, we need good science. And you know, science for 
helping to create and manage these protected areas includes an understanding of, of what was there before, that baseline that Francois was talking about, but also what happens over time after these places are protected yeah, relative to the rest of the, of the ocean. And that includes and what happens underwater, but also what happens in the local economies. So it's this multidisciplinary approach is very, very important. And the explorations of Monaco are going to help to set some of these ecological baselines for some of the places that are the best uh, baseline we have now for what the ocean used to be like. But equally important is also the communication of these facts to inspire leaders and citizens alike to understand that there are solutions that we can apply today with quick and, and long-lasting benefits. So another key component of the explorations of Monaco is going to be to produce compelling media to inspire people to fall in love with these places that the Yersin will visit, but also to inspire them to preserve them. So the science and the economics are very clear. Marine reserves work for nature and for people, and we need many more of them. The 10% target of the United Nations by 2020 is not the goal, it's just a milestone. There is scientific agreement that we should protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. So there is a lot of hard work to do, but we are all very excited to partner with Monseigneur, your foundation, and, and the Yersin to be part of these explorations of Monaco that will help, to, will contribute to getting more of the ocean under protection. So having said that, Monseigneur, uh, may I ask you to conclude, please? Thank you very much, Enric. To conclude very briefly this presentation, I'd like to thank all those who've made this project possible. Uh, the government and the National Council of Monaco, first of all, who understand early on the interest and the many implications for the Principality of Monaco, the various partners, in particular the Scientific Center of Monaco, the Oceanographic Institute, the Oceanographic Museum, my foundation, of course, and the Yacht Club of Monaco. And there are many other entities that uh, I could mention, but it would take too long. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of scientific and environmental partners who've given this project its coherence. The owner of the Yersin, Francois Fiat, and his family, thanks to whom we've been able to charter this magnificent ship. And finally, uh, the teams of the, of the explorations of Monaco, and especially the captain of the Yersin, Jean Dumaret and his crew, whose talents I think will be invaluable uh, during these uh, uh, next three years. With everyone's combined efforts, we have succeeded in carrying out this great project, which will become a reality in just a few weeks. The Yersin is now in its final preparations, uh, the fitting out of different uh, equipments, the labs that we, that we mentioned, uh, in, in the manner that was recommended, of course, by, by the scientific co committee and uh, uh, the different equipments uh, needed for uh, exploration. So we will soon uh, be all set to receive uh, the uh, scores of different scientists under optimum conditions who will find, I think, a unique platform proportionate to the importance of their work. The, the, You've heard in the video that the Yersin will leave the harbor of Monaco on the 27th of July of this year on a three-year voyage. We will see it cross many of the world's oceans and, above all, con contribute, I think we all hope, to bring about a new understanding, a new vision uh, of our ocean and to discover better ways to keep it healthy for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsignor. I think we have time for a few questions. Please identify yourself and your organization, please. Thanks very much. Uh, Serene Highness, Professors Leinen and Gail, uh, on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, a warm welcome to the, the United Nations and thank you for this briefing. Uh, my name is Sherman Bricebees, uh, a correspondent for South African Broadcasting, and that is complete coincidence, uh, Serene Highness. Uh, <laughs> no, we planned. We planned it uh, especially for you. Uh, a question perhaps for each of you. Uh, Professor Leinen, could you talk about how the scientists for the vessel will be procured? Where will they come from and how will that process work? 
And perhaps uh, for you, Professor Gail, uh, could you talk about how the ship will be powered? Uh, I imagine you won't be using sails, so perhaps just explain, uh, you know, in the absence of fuel and, and that sort of stuff. And Serene Highness, uh, recently uh, President Donald Trump, I mean, this is a political question, and I imagine you're the best place to answer this one, Pro Professor. Um, President Trump, of course, withdrawing the United States from the Paris Agreement. I wonder if you could uh, weigh in on, on that decision. Thank you. Actually, uh, Francois and I may want to switch uh, answers. Uh, um, uh, we could both talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, developing the science program, but do you want to start with that? Uh, well, we have a scientific committee which is uh, looking at, uh, well, what are the updates we will have uh, related to the question that uh, we were discussing about the biodiversity, uh, uh, large uh, marine animals and so on. And we organize the, the things in order to have on the ship uh, the convenient uh, equipment which will be really defined uh, in correspondence with the scientists are asking for. And it's very uh, unusual that, because usually you have a ship, and with the ship, you adapt your research to what the ship has as a potential. But this time, it's quite different. You have some research question, scientific question, and you adapt the ship to the question that you want to solve. And this is very unique, I think. Uh, and a little bit about the, um, the ship. It's not so much that the ship has a different sort of propulsion or power system. It's that uh, there have been um, uh, procedures and technology put in place so that uh, everything that c that would normally be uh, waste from the the propulsion, both stack gas and uh, uh, grease, uh, oil, etc., is captured mm, uh, and does not go overboard or does not go into the into the atmosphere. Mm. Uh, even the uh, grease and oil from cooking and from uh, what we consume on the ship. Uh, I'm even told that the uh, washing machines, uh, the effluent from the washing machines doesn't go directly into the ocean mm -hmm. because, of course, um, half of us, are, our clothes are half plastic and, uh, and the fibers from this become part of the plastic microfiber de debris that we find in the ocean. So every a uh, effort has been made to collect that. So it's not that the propulsion is so different, mm -hmm. it's that all of the systems mm -hmm. for keeping the ship clean are so different. <laughs> um, well, I was able to express myself on, on the, uh, on the on the United States withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, which I think in everybody's mind is, is catastrophic. Um, but I think this, this only has uh, made everybody uh, more aware of the importance of the issue and uh, has, I think, made us even more determined to, uh, uh, to reach the goals that uh, all our countries have, have put forward to uh, meet the targets that uh, were demanded by the Paris Agreement, and so I think, uh, and I, I think there was a wonderful reaction right right here in the U.S. as well, of uh, from the corporate world, from the uh, from the mayors of different cities, uh, from the governors of different different states. Uh, so I think there'll be a tremendous movement to uh, to keep on going and, and to keep. Uh, uh, the fight against climate change alive uh, around the world and in this country. And I think uh, we're still a few years away from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Paris Agreement is made up in such a way that, you, you know, that no country can, can leave right uh, then and, and now. It, 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 takes, uh, it takes at least three years, and, uh, three, uh, three and a half years now. So there might be, a, that, that, that there might still be hope. 
think everybody is uh, crossing their fingers for that, that uh, there, might be a, there might be a reversal of that decision. Thank you. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, a question on the, the, where the ship is going. Is there any particular area of the ocean that you're most excited for it to reach and research? Um, and just a follow-up, if President Trump was right here right now, what would you try and say to him to convince him otherwise? <laughs> Thanks a lot. I mean, a lot of <laughs> Um, I would try to, I would try to tell, to tell him uh, very simply to uh, listen a little more carefully to scientists and to the scientific evidence that is, has been out there for, for quite a while now, and, uh, and to, you know, just uh, look at uh, the Tremendous implications that uh, 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 that go along with with having the U.S. Uh, withdraw from the Paris Agreement, and um, it's it is disheartening. But as I said, uh, we 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 have to keep on fighting, and, and our determination is is there. And, and he has, I think he 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 should listen to. Uh, to more people who have been dealing with these issues for quite some time now, and who uh, uh, I think have a pretty good idea of, of what it uh, what it means and what it implies for the future, and uh, it's because we're not, as I've said many times before, we're not doing this, and we all know this. We're not doing this just for ourselves, not for now, but for future generations, and. Uh, I think that should resonate in most uh, in most people's minds and and hearts. And yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Which, which area of the ocean? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. please. Uh, for me, the areas that I'm most excited about the ship uh, going to are the South Pacific. Uh, which is one of the least studied of the oceans, uh, and the, the central Indian Ocean, same thing. Uh, at the, those are areas of the ocean that we don't get to very often uh, and that, that have not been studied in detail. And uh, every time that we go to an area like that, uh, we find that, that there are uh, aspects of it that we had no idea were there. Uh, for example, uh, a, re a cruise about six or seven years ago in the South Pacific found that the, it was so far away from land, there was so little material coming in that there was no accumulation of sediment, of mud on the bottom of a large portion of the South Pacific Ocean. No other ocean, no other region is like that. So imagine being able to go with, with many scientists looking at many different aspects to a place that has only been visited uh, a few times by oceanographers. So for me, those are the most exciting pieces of this plan. If, if I may add to, you, to your question, there is a place, that there are, the boat is going to visit, be visiting extraordinary places, but there is one that I'm particularly excited about is the Southern Line Islands. It belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. It's uh, in the South Pacific, north of French Polynesia. And we conducted uh, an expedition in 2009, and we found the most pristine coral reefs uh, in the Pacific, where, where the predators outweigh, outweigh their prey and very healthy coral reefs. And we, don't, we haven't been back since the place was protected by President Tong of Kiribati in 2014. So we don't know how this place has dealt with an extreme warming event that uh, went across the Pacific last year that killed so many corals in the Great Barrier Reef. So this place, so it's basically, we're going back to a place that was pristine a few years ago. And this place is going to be a very important test of uh, the role that protection can play 
in, in uh, the resilience of the ocean and are coral reefs that are protected going to be able to cope better with the effects of climate change. So this is, uh, and personally for me, is one of the, mo one of the most exciting uh, parts of the exploration. Monsignor, please. Yeah, I just want to add to that that uh, uh, it's not only uh, listening to Enric to describe uh, different pristine uh, uh, places, and I'm very honored also to be on the Pristine Seas uh, 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 Honorary Board, but um, and to, to listen to him to describe what the Line Islands were all about, that uh, and that and and also the uh, when I when I visited the uh, Tubataha Reef in the Philippines with uh, uh, a small group of us, uh, the people from Monaco and the, and the museum uh, last year, th th those were really the and to see what uh, uh, what beautiful uh, uh, reefs th those were as well. Uh, those, I think, were the two determining uh, factors to, that uh, led us to, to try to put this project together. Of course, it was the, then the availability of the vessel itself, but uh, uh, the, the desire to go to these very remote, but very pristine places and to better understand them and better uh, comprehend the, the, the mechanisms that, uh, that are in place there. Uh, that that uh, uh, we then built the the, the, the and tracked the, uh, the the suggested course, and then of course the, the, the scientific interest in in other places as well. But I think those, uh, for me, that was uh, also the determining factor to 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 go forward with this project. Thank you, Monsignor. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Your Serene Highness Professors. My name is Ahmed Fatih, American Television News. Uh, let's uh, get closer to the home uh, front, to the waterfront. Uh, Monaco is a prime uh, tourist destination. Uh, summertime is a heavy uh, traffic in the Mediterranean, one of the most polluted uh, uh, surface of water in the world. Uh, what is Monaco's uh, policies and practices towards conducting a clean marine tourism uh, during the, the high season, and how is it uh, contributing to the overall uh, protection of the Mediterranean, or what's left of the Mediterranean? Thank you. Yes, the Mediterranean is, is uh, a sea, well, as all uh, seas and, and oceans uh, on our planet, uh, in danger and, and, uh, and, and suffering, but uh, we, there, there have been a certain number of, uh, of uh, initiatives uh, in the, the last few decades that have been put in place. One, of course, was uh, uh, initiated by the principality and, and uh, by, by my father also, the, the, uh, the Ramoge project to, uh, uh, for the better surveillance and, and uh, uh, monitoring of uh, coastal pollution uh, between France, Italy, and the Principality of Monaco. Uh, so an area that goes from, from, from saint Rafael in, in France to Genoa, passing through Monaco. And so that was kind of a pilot project in, it, in its time and, and has expanded and has expanded to, um, in, to incorporate also not only uh, uh, coastal areas, but uh, any uh, to coordinate a more rapid response to uh, 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 gas, oil and gas uh, accidents and, and the pollution that would result from these accidents in that area of the Mediterranean. And so, and that's the, that's, that's the Hamush Pol plan that, and we conduct uh, different exercises between with the French and Italian navies and uh, what little means we also have in Monaco that can contribute to uh, have a coordinated and efficient response in case of those th types of accidents. Um, now, if you look at, uh, uh, we, we monitor, of course, in Monaco, the quality of the water on a, on a regular basis. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, we, we also have a, a very small 
but uh, I think very resilient and and, and uh, a, a reserve, a, a marine protected area, if you want, but, but a marine reserve, as we call it, uh, just off the beaches of, of Monaco, which is a uh, not only a no fishing zone, but a, 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 you cannot navigate in this in this uh, in this corridor or this in this reserve, and uh, it, it has uh, it's been uh, it, it was established over 40 years ago, and it's still in I, I think in very good shape. Henrik has been there too, uh, and uh, I've been I've done a few dives there myself, and uh, to see the. Uh, the different species that uh, were very scarce a few years ago, and to see them come back, and to see the also the uh, Posidonia uh, fields that have that have re re reconquered their their territory uh, makes it, I think, a, a, a healthy as healthy as possible an ecosystem in an in, in an urban setting. Um, now there are different other parts of Monaco. Uh, where the water quality seems to be very good because we have a small uh, company that, that has established a, 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 the, the, an oyster farm, and that is on the on the eastern uh, side of Mon uh, sorry on the western side of Monaco, um, uh, and uh, they, it's been in operation for what is it, five or six years now, or even more, uh, and they've they're expanding their their uh, their farm in limited capacity, of course, because we have limited space. But uh, they would not be allowed to uh, uh, pursue uh, this oyster farm if the water quality was not impeccable. And so it's not totally uh, right to say that it's a very polluted area. We have a Ligurian current that comes uh, that comes along the coast and comes from Italy uh, that has in the past. Uh, and still does, on some occasion, uh, we there, there there is some pollution that that does go by there, uh, but in a limited quantity, and we have enough uh, equipment to uh, uh, respond to those uh, to those situations as well. Um, so I think, all in all, we we, uh, we have. A, as good a system as possible for for a small city state like like us, and uh, but we work very closely, of course, with French and Italian authorities to to uh, uh, make sure there's uh, uh, that, that that is controlled also in uh, on the Italian coast and on the and on the French side as well. Thank you, Monsignor. And unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. We have to conclude the press conference. But I think this, uh, your statement ends the press conference with a, a positive note, the, the fact that there are solutions that are already implemented even in urban environments. So thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Francoise and Margaret. Thank you, everyone, for joining.